Today we shift our focus away from the city of Rome and instead look at the empire that Rome conquered. As we'll see, it's interesting to note that Rome, which started out as just a city on the Tiber, created an empire which is fundamentally an empire of cities. We won't cover all of them. In some of the previous lectures, we've looked at various cities in detail and talked about some of their history from the Roman period. What we'll do instead is focus specifically on the colonii or colonies that Rome set up. As we'll see, these were pretty varied in nature and in purpose, and they are surprisingly diverse in terms of where they're located and their significance for later civilizations. This map gives you an indication through dots of where different Roman colonies were planted. As you can see, a huge number of them were in Italy, and that is no accident. We'll talk about why that was the case. So we'll start out by looking at the role that cities play in general in governing the Roman Empire, and then talk about how colonies function, and then transition to look at specific colonies around the Roman world and what they were like. Starting in the Republican period and becoming much more regularized in the imperial period, the way that Roman government worked in the provinces is that there were a number of cities, including a provincial capital, in each province. The governor, who was dispatched for either a year or sometimes a few years, would go and work the circuit as sort of a roving judge, and he would address problems as they arose while also collecting taxes and perhaps responding to any kind of unrest or what have you. The governors would mostly only react to the demands of the locals rather than trying to be proactive. The best way to think of Roman government is that it was very libertarian in the sense that it tried to be as hands-off as possible. Since Roman governors were the only officials entitled to give a sentence of death, part of imperium is the power to uh, dole out a sentence of death. This meant that any time there was, say, a murderer who was apprehended, the governor would be the one who would have to approve the sentence of death. So sometimes prisoners would get a long stay of execution waiting for a governor to arrive on tour. Um, of course, the most famous example of Roman governor is Pontius Pilate from the Bible, and the way that he behaves in trying to not execute Jesus as long as possible is actually 100% accurate in terms of the way that Roman governors typically behaved. After all, you can't revoke a death penalty once it's been inflicted. And they tended to err on the side of caution and being hands-off. They tried to delay providing help to the local authorities, that way the local authorities would come up with some other solution or the problem would blow over before they had to hand down a solution. Rome thought that its majesty and its power were best preserved if it was used more sparingly and if its governors didn't get too micromanagey with local affairs. When we think about Roman maps, we also see that cities are very much central to the Roman conception of how their empire worked and where things were. Roman maps were not geographically realistic and they were not accurate to scale. What they were really in many ways were just itineraries showing various roads in the Roman world and then listing the cities that you would run into as you went down a particular road. The idea is that it was an empire of cities, and this is very much how the Romans thought of it. That being said, most of the empire's population was rural and agricultural, but the Roman mindset, that is the conception of the elite who, while they would often have large estates, tended to live in towns when possible, always revolved around urban centers. If you were a wealthy person and you wanted to ensure your place in history, you would erect a great monument in a city. And if you wanted to conduct business, that's where you went. If you wanted to get involved in politics, that's where you had to go, whether you wanted to get involved in local politics or in the politics of the empire as a whole. So cities were critical to the what we might call the high culture of Rome and also the governmental functions of Rome. Let's transition to talk about the colonii in more general terms. What were the purposes of the colonii? How did establishing colonies help Rome as a whole? 
The first reason why colonies were established, and this very much is the story of Rome's early history, is in order to help increase Roman control over contested areas. By planning down loyal Roman subjects in these areas, the Romans thought that this would increase their control and give them a fortified foothold at their enemy's doorstep. As we'll see, this was essentially the heart of the strategy that Rome used to conquer Italy. Another great thing that colonies helped to do was to reduce urban poverty in Rome itself. You might be thinking, well, that is thoughtful of the Roman leadership. As we studied in the last video, they weren't terribly interested in political representation. So why are they so interested in alleviating poverty? Well, they weren't. What they did understand, though, is that poverty leads to unrest. And if you're in a crowded ancient environment, such as a city of like Rome, if the peasants get unhappy and start to revolt or riot, it can become very dangerous even for people who are protected by armed guards. Um, it's not the same as modern technology, stuff like machine guns, gas, etc., where you can offset numbers to a massive extent. Um, so as we see with the Nika riots in Constantinople in the 6th century, if a crowd is sufficiently angry, they can overrun and overtake armed trained soldiers at least with pre-modern weaponry. Another reason for some Republican senators to have a slightly bigger heart than their peers is that it was understood in the Republican era that if you are a senator who sponsors a colony, that the people of that colony will remember that you helped them out. And therefore, if they happen to be visiting Rome at the time of an election and you're running, or say your son is running, well, they will pay you back because they owe you their livelihood. And Rome had a system of patronage. There has been some pushback as to how deeply entrenched it was. Nonetheless, it does seem to have been a feature of Roman life. In the late Republic and then into the Imperial periods, another new expectation that arose with the professionalization of the Roman army is that retiring legionary veterans expected to either be paid off with an allotment of land that they could use as a sustainable farm or with a cash bonus that they could then use to purchase land and live out the rest of their lives with their families on an estate. Well, early on in the empire, Rome had just conquered Gaul, so there was a lot of land available, and that was one way you could help to settle Gaul while also taking care of the problem of the veterans. Over time, as most of the land gets settled, this becomes a bigger issue. But in the early empire, one of the easiest things to do for Augustus is he's downsizing this massive army that he and Antony raised to fight a civil war, was to find areas that had been depopulated by Roman conquest and fill them up with colonies. So it was both a way to increase Roman control and also um, make veterans happy and get them out of their uniforms and let them you know, put down their swords. So this was good policy. Not all colonies were exactly the same, and we'll see that over time, Roman colonies will serve a number of different purposes. And when they do serve different purposes, sometimes they deviate in terms of how they actually function. So most of the colonies that Rome planted in Italy were of the let's turtle out from Rome and create fortified areas and then inch our way into enemy territory, stifling the commerce of other cities and creating alternative power centers, and then giving our people land where they can breed, have more children, and build a huge population base. As Rome managed to conquer Etruria, Samnium, Campania, and its local areas, it then built up huge manpower reserves, and after that, it was able to conquer more quickly and without the need to turtle tediously out. And turtle is more of a wargaming term. It means to advance very slowly, you know, build, go a few miles, build a fort, and to keep doing it over and over and over very methodically. Another type of colony that the Romans established was to either to resettle some or all of an existing non-Roman city. So sometimes the Romans would find a semi-depopulated city in Greece or somewhere like that, and then dispatch Roman colonists, and then they would mingle with the locals and create more or less refound a community. They'd bring in extra money and bodies, and the community would become officially Roman. Um, 
and it was a way of sort of urban revitalization combined with creating more Roman control in non-Roman lands. They also sometimes completely refounded cities that had been destroyed. Both Corinth and Carthage were rebuilt by the Romans, and they were resettled with people from Rome. Now, eventually, the people of Corinth would be more or less integrated back into Greek culture, but at Carthage, this would become one the second biggest city in the West. So this was one of the key Roman centers after it was reestablished by the Romans. And in fact, all of the ruins of Carthage today that we have, with a very few exceptions, are all from the Roman period. As for frontier colonii, these are much more haphazard in their growth. Augustus decided to settle down on a set frontier, mostly along the Rhine and Danube rivers. There was also an eastern frontier that we'll look a little less at. But the Rhine and Danube were the two biggest frontiers, and here the Romans would inadvertently, in some cases, end up founding many of the major cities of modern Europe. A lot of times what would happen is that they would start with a military base, and then around it would spring up a civilian population, and then that would evolve into a full-fledged city. Other times it was the intention of the Romans all along to create a city, but oftentimes not so much. This also occurs in Britain, and we'll see that at least one very famous city in Britain and one very famous city in France owes its origins to Roman activity. From the early colonies of Italy to the frontier fortresses of Augustus and his successors, one common feature of colonii is that they tended to be laid out on a grid pattern which is both similar to the Hellenistic foundations that we see with Alexander's engineers and also not unlike the patterns that the Romans used when they created their military camps. The Roman army actually dug the same camp every night when it entrenched. And when they created permanent fortresses, they just created more elaborate forms of that. Rather than relying on earthworks, they would instead create actual stone fortifications. But the basic idea was the same. And there are still sections of modern cities in places like France and Germany where you can see this pattern at the center of the city, at least in the old part of town. On the frontiers, sometimes colonii would be located near legionary bases, and what they were in many cases were officially sanctioned settlements of veterans who had retired from service after 16 to 20 years, and sometimes those ended up mingling with the unofficial towns that would emerge near the bases themselves. Because soldiers were not allowed to marry technically, but in practice, many of them had families on the side, and then they would only get married and make it official after they retired. But their wives and children would often live just outside of the camp walls, in kind of a makeshift town, which would then serve as the needs of the troops. There were laundry women, blacksmiths, um, prostitutes, all kinds of different people who performed services for the legions. And this created a kind of local frontier economy. There were also traders who went back and forth, um, you know, each side of the frontier to trade different goods. So basically what happened is these towns emerged in a semi-organic fashion as all of this kind of blended together over time, especially after the fall of the Roman Empire, when, you know, the fort could then be fully integrated since there was no longer a Roman authority to keep the fort separate. As I mentioned earlier, the colonii of early Rome were very much the key tool for Rome's conquest of Italy, especially in the early years. This is also how Rome came to have such a massive manpower pool. It would take sometimes only 300 or so families and send them off to create a fortified camp near an enemy city. Then it would serve as an impediment to that city. As it grew over time, the Romans were able to recruit more men from that place and this enabled them to expand their population and their control of different places. So again, it was what I described as the turtling strategy. Colonists do not seem to have had much of an independent civic life, however, so these were not much like the Greek colonies that we studied in the past. They're really more like the Athenian clerukes, the settlers who were sent out and then they lived elsewhere outside of Athens but they were still Athenians who participated in the political system of Athens. This seems to be how the Roman colonies functioned. 
So the men who were in the Roman colonies, if they wanted to vote in an election, they would need to go back to Rome at election time. This means, of course, that most of them weren't able to do so because some of their towns would be under threat because they're on an enemy frontier. And if not, then they still had agricultural work to do. So effectively, they were exercising, they had rights they couldn't actually use, which in the minds of the Roman elite was just dandy because they were not huge fans of letting the people actually use their rights any more than they absolutely had to. To relate this back to the last video, I mentioned the infrastructure of Rome itself, the various roads which connected Italy, and the aqueducts which fed Rome. The same is true on a different scale across the empire. In many ways, while there were no cities as large as Rome itself, some of the engineering feats that the Romans accomplished in the provinces were more impressive than what they did near Rome. There were easier ways to get water to Rome, for instance, than there were for some of the cities that the Romans put in places like modern Spain and France. So most of the really impressive aqueducts are found outside of Italy. In terms of creating a road network to connect the whole empire, there were areas of the empire which were harder to create roads in than others. The Balkans, for instance, are mountainous, as is Anatolia. So the road networks the Romans created there were more impressive in many ways than the ones that they created in Italy and in Gaul, or as it's known today, France. But all these roads served much the same purpose as they did back in Rome itself. They connected all of the various cities. They allowed for the easy movement of troops, news, and goods. And it really made the Roman world coherent. It brought everything together. As I mentioned, all maps that the Romans built were basically maps of roads. They were more like atlases than what we would think of as a map that we'd hang on the wall today to get a feel for um, the actual scale and size and shape of a place. Now I'm going to transition to look at 12 colonii from Roman history. I'm looking at these chronologically based on their date of foundation, but I've chosen sites which were established between the Middle Republic and the early empire. These are both the best documented Roman colonii and also the period during which Rome was planning most of the colonies it would ever plant. After this point, growth in the empire slowed down dramatically and before this point, Rome was more or less fighting for control of central Italy. So, first we'll look at Ariminum on the Adriatic coast. This area had an interesting history. When the Etruscans were really thriving, they conquered it and set up the city first. Then the Celts from the north invaded Italy and they took the site for a time. But then a native Italian people, the Umbrians, took it. And then finally it fell to the Romans. The Romans, soon after they acquired the area, set up a colony here in 268 BCE. Ariminum was one of the keys to Rome's control of the Adriatic coast. By planning a coastal colony, Rome gave itself a stranglehold on the area, and it would have cut into Samnite control, and also provided some separation between the Samnites and others. Now, another factor at this time is this was when the Samnites are basically defeated, but they still haven't given up their identity. So Rome still could potentially face revolts from the Samnites. So one of the purposes of Ariminum is to be a stronghold in the event of another Samnite war. This never really materialized in the 260s, but Ariminum would then prove its worth again during the Second Punic War because Hannibal's strategy was to get Italians who were not happy with Roman rule to revolt and one of the key peoples that he approached were the Samnites, also the Umbrians and others. So Ariminum was responsible for holding down its little area and making sure that it stayed loyal to Rome. Ariminum prospered because it was at the crossroads of two of the major Roman roads of Italy, the Via Emilia and the Via Papilia. It probably reached its peak in the early empire, and the reason that I say that is because it's two key monuments, the two things it's most famous for, the Arch of Augustus and the Bridge of Tiberius, both date to this period. Interestingly enough, in the empire, while much of the architecture which commemorates the emperors had a very propagandistic tone to it, all of it was actually locally produced. 
the locals tried to win the favor of the emperors by building things and then naming them after the emperors and talk about how divine and great the emperors were. This is the Bridge of Tiberius. It was a well-built structure and it still stands in pretty decent shape to this day. One quick final note about the city of Ariminum. Today it is known as Rimini and it actually reached its peak during the Renaissance period. So if you want to learn more about it, I suggest you look it up. It had a pretty interesting history after the Roman period. But now let's fast forward 50 years from the foundation of Ariminum and go west to Iberia. Here we find the colony of Terraco. This city had an interesting history. It is located in the northeast corner of Spain on the Mediterranean coast. So it is near the Pyrenees Mountains, it's near the Mediterranean coast, and it also has access to the interior of Iberia. So it's perfectly situated for trade. It originated as a native Iberian settlement around the 5th century or so. We know from Greek text that this was a place which did a lot of business with both Greek and Phoenician merchants, and it would have been one of the stops for them in the Western Mediterranean. When the Scipio brothers, these being the father and uncle of Scipio Africanus, arrived with the Roman army to challenge Hannibal's relatives for control of Spain, this was their main base of operations, and it remained the main base of Roman operations for a very long time. From 217, when the Scipio brothers arrived, it was effectively a Roman city, at least in fact, if not by um, popular acclaim. One of, if not the most enduring monuments of Terraco is a famous aqueduct that the locals in Spanish call the Devil's Bridge. It still stands today, as you can see, and it dominates the landscape, and it's really a testament to both the skill of Roman engineers and also the enduring power of Roman engineering, because this thing still stands. And I'm not sure if this one still delivers water, but there are quite a few aqueducts in the Roman world, or the former Roman world, which actually still deliver at least some water. Terraco would have really prospered from about the 2nd century BCE until the 1st century CE, and a lot of the reason for this is that it would have gotten a lot of foot traffic from the Roman legions as they moved in and out of Spain nearly every year. Although the Romans took a significant chunk of Spain from Carthage at the end of the Second Punic War, it wasn't until the time of Augustus when the conquest of Spain was completed. The local Iberian tribes were very resilient. So, this meant that legions coming in and out of Iberia would stop at Terraco, and men could spend money, commanders might requisition supplies, and then recompense the locals. It was a great opportunity for merchants to make money. So uh, Terraco would have been a major sort of waypoint. And after that is over, what we see is that production or you know the production of new monuments and buildings in Terraco really slows down. And by the late second century CE, it is in full scale decline. It's no longer nearly so important as it used to be. I'm sure that many of you thought that Rome would only be planting colonies outside of Italy after the first example of a colony at Ariminum. But in fact, Rome still had some work to do in Italy itself. One such example is the colony of Salernum in sort of southwestern Italy on the coast. This is today's Salerno, and yes, it was the site of a World War II landing. Your memory of the History Channel does serve you correctly. What happened in the Second Punic War is that Hannibal's last base of operations was in the southwest of Italy, so the Romans very much questioned the loyalty of this area, and therefore they decided to plant a colony here. So that's just what they did. They took colonists and planted them at the site of Salernum. Here, the archaeological remains are a little bit scanty. We don't have a ton of information about the Roman period for Salerno. However, what little we have suggests the site was prosperous, and based on the richness of the region in general, there's no reason to think that it couldn't have been prosperous. It also served as a local capital city by the 3rd century CE, so it must have grown from its initial foundation by a significant margin.
under Diocletian, it became the capital of the combined Lucania and Brutium province. So it was one of the more important cities in southern Italy. It had an interesting medieval history as well in terms of its role in Byzantine Italy. It was largely untouched by the Gothic wars between Byzantium and the Ostrogoths, and it also remained largely untouched by the Lombards after they invaded and took up the part of the Goths against the Byzantines. However, in 646, it fell to the Lombards and thus officially fell out of Roman hands for good. Sulla famously fought a civil war with Marius, and he did not take kindly to anyone who did not take his side. So he found the city of Fisile, one of the most prosperous Etruscan cities, to be disloyal, and he had it destroyed. This helped to contribute to the fall of Etruscan culture by about 10 BC that I discussed in a previous video. In the time of Caesar, when he was consul in 59, he decided to sponsor a colony to resettle this area. This was a great place to plant a colony since it would no doubt thrive just as Fisile had. Originally, the colony was sited near the ruins of Fisile and it was called Fluentia because it was between the flow of two rivers. Over time, Fluentia became Florentia and it is of course today's Florence. Ancient Florentia lay along the path of the Via Cassia and also in the rich Arno Valley, and not surprisingly, it quickly became a prosperous settlement. Its initial design looked like an army camp, even though by this point it was nowhere near any frontier and there was no reason for it to appear in that way, but that was simply how the Romans laid things out now. Florentia, interestingly enough, would of course hit its stride during the Renaissance, but one of the major narratives about the Renaissance cities is that these were the cities of Northern Italy which were the least devastated by the wars of the early Middle Ages. However, Florentia very much was devastated by the Gothic Wars. So this is the war between the Ostrogoths and Justinian's uh, forces which tried to reconquer in the name of Rome during the 6th century, and Florentia was one of the chief battlefields. In fact, it was so devastated that the city's population may have fallen to as low as about a thousand people. Yet, fast forward to the Renaissance period, and Florence is perhaps the most powerful of all of the Renaissance Italian states, with the exception of Milan, which was massive. But yeah, and also Florence was a huge cultural center in the Renaissance. So um, whenever you hear any historical narrative, always be aware that there are usually some exceptions to the rule. And here is a good example in Florence. Let's now move north into Gaul. We won't be moving very far chronologically, however, since now we have Caesar after his consulship of 59 taking up a proconsular command in Gaul, which will last for just under a decade, and see Caesar conquer pretty much all of modern France and a lot of what is now Belgium as well. Um, the Romans already held southern France, but he basically conquers all of the rest. And one of the areas that he conquers is, of course, the region which holds Paris. Each of the Gallic tribes before Caesar's, Caesar's arrival had basically set up what were known as Oppida. An Oppidum is a fortified center that the tribe would use as a gathering place and also as a trading place. It wasn't quite a city, but it fulfilled a lot of the functions of a city. It was really more of a retreat, kind of like Helm's Deep in Lord of the Rings or something like that. Anyhow, one tribe called the Parisii erected their oppidum at Paris on the island in the river. This happened around 250 or so BCE. We'll see that this pattern of the Romans taking an existing oppidum and developing it into a full-fledged colony is something that they do a few times at least. The new city was named Lutetia Parisiorum, which means the Swamp of the Parisians. Assuming that you can translate Parisii as Parisians, really it'd be the Swamp of the Parisii. So it was a way for the Romans to honor the locals, many of whom would have settled in the city and perhaps been the majority of the inhabitants, but also to make fun of the topography. They found Paris to be rather swampy and frankly not great. 
So I guess in that sense, you could say that Paris and Washington, D.C. are similar in that both began life as swamps. One became the city of lights, and the other is still a swamp. But let's not go there. Caesar Julian later used the city of Lutetia Parisiorum as the capital of Roman Gaul. It had been located before this in the city of Trier, but in 357, when he was acting as his cousin's sort of representative and heir in the West, he decided that Lutetia Parisiorum was a better base. Paris, just to use the modern name, was located more to the east of France than the west, so it was more located there. Actually, it'd be Gaul, of course. France comes later when you have the Franks invade. Um, it was also here, interestingly enough, that Julian will be proclaimed emperor by his troops in 360. So, if you are a fan of Julian the Apostate, this city is actually somewhere which has significance for his life. Unfortunately, there aren't all that many remains of the Roman period in Paris, at least not compared with many other sites, and the reason is because it has always been a prosperous city and it's constantly being built upon and inhabited. Over time, the Lutetia part of its name was dropped, and instead of saying of the Parisii, it was just shortened to be Paris. Apida were quite common, and it seems that almost every major tribe in Gaul had at least one Apidum that they used as a refuge and trading center. Another major Apidum was that at Lugdunum, in sort of the southeast of Gaul. This was distinctly to the north of the Roman province of Transalpine Gaul, but it wasn't quite on the frontier either. That being said, it was not a massive distance away from the territory that Rome had long controlled. Caesar, of course, conquered this along with the rest of Gaul. And soon after Caesar's assassination, a second civil war broke out back in Rome. In order to try to keep order in Gaul and prevent a, an uprising by the recently conquered locals, the governor of Gaul, Lucius Munatius Plancus, took local Roman refugees from another nearby colony that Caesar had planted and resettled them at the site of Lugdunum. He kept the local Gallic name and it quickly grew into a major center and was part of Rome's strategy for controlling Gaul. Lugdunum became a major center and it, during the first and second centuries CE, it had an imperial mint, four aqueducts, and a population in excess of 40,000 people. Most Roman cities were not all that big, don't let the size of Rome fool you, so this was considered one of the bigger cities in Gaul and one of the more important. During the barbarian invasions of the 5th century, much of Gaul was carved up by invading forces, and Lugdunum fell to the Burgundian kingdom and became their chief city. Quick programming note on Lugdunum. This city is now called Lyon and it remains a fairly major city in France today. Moving back to Spain, as I mentioned earlier, it took a long time for the Romans to fully conquer Iberia. And the course of that conquest required the foundation of many colonies. And a lot of these colonies would continue to churn out legionaries who would then be sent to other parts of the empire. One of the major colonies that was planted in Iberia, which really helped to finish off the conquest, was Augusta Emerita. This city was founded in 25 BCE as Augustus was trying to get the number of legions down to a sustainable 28 and he decided to create this colony to increase control in Spain. The soldiers themselves were called emeriti because they were retired. If you've ever heard of a professor emeritus, this means a retired professor. It is not a coincidence that these are the same words. Latin tends to be circulated quite a bit in academia today. So um, this would serve later as the capital of the province of Lusitania, which is basically some of the western parts of what is now Spain, and then almost all of what is now Portugal. The city itself is located in what is today Spain. 
It has two aqueducts and two fora. Fora, of course, being the plural for forum. It also had an imperial mint. So the city had a fairly sizable population and also would have had quite a bit of commerce. And that makes sense if you consider that it's a provincial capital and that it was one of the major cities in its province. So it would have been sort of the entry point for people going to the far west of Iberia. It also had some other structures which are interesting. It has a well-preserved theater, a well-preserved amphitheater. It has an arch of Trajan. And then it has another structure which has been labeled as the Temple of Diana in scare quotes. I featured that here because this is the most interesting in many ways because it's not entirely clear exactly what this temple was for. Some people think that this was a temple to the cult of Augustus, which would make sense since he was the founder and he was more important to the, this colony's history than he was to most, but we simply don't know. And this structure is centered pretty much downtown in today's Merida, Spain. So, you know, something that you might hit if you were just going through the center of town. Pretty cool. In Judea, there was a settlement called Stratton's Tower. This was a Jewish settlement, and when Pompey conquered the area and annexed it as Roman Palestine, he granted Stratton's Tower autonomy. This was in 63 when he made his great eastern settlement. It was later rearranged, and then it was given as a gift to a local client king named Herod the Great. Herod decided to take this city, patronize it, and really expand it. He named it Sebastos in honor of the Emperor Augustus. Sebastos is the Greek equivalent of Augustus, and Herod the Great was a Hellenized Jew, so this was the language that he was much more familiar with, so that is what he went with. Later on, after Herod has his time with it, Herod tries to develop a great harbor, but his harbor plan collapses because the material is not quite hard enough. The city is still pretty nice, though, except for the harbor. So the Romans, after Herod's kingdom is dissolved, they take over this area and make Caesarea, as it's now called, the provincial capital of Judea. Now, due to the work of Herod and then the Romans, it is made into one of the largest harbors on the entire coast of the Levant. And it's also is a city which is very friendly to the Romans and much more Roman, Romanized than most of the rest of this region. So while most of the inhabitants are Hellenized Jews, they are still people who are very compatible with the Romans in terms of having cultural similarity and you know, generally benefiting from Roman rule enough that they are well disposed towards the Romans. So this will now become the provincial capital and the Romans will erect government buildings here and the governors will primarily reside here and then go out on the circuit to other parts of Judea, including to Jerusalem. We actually found a document here by Pontius Pilate and this would have actually been where he spent most of his time rather than in Jerusalem. In fact, most Roman governors would have probably felt much more comfortable at Caesarea than they would have at Jerusalem. Supposedly, according to one travel writer, Caesarea's port was so large that it actually rivaled the Piraeus in size. Whether that's true or not is hard to say. The city was destroyed during the Arab invasions around 640, and until that time it had been the primary base of operations for Roman forces. During the Jewish revolt of 66 to 70, this was the headquarters that Vespasian and his son Titus used from which to subdue the Jewish people. There's still a modern city which bears a name very similar to Caesarea, but um, the ruins of Caesarea itself are right here, and it was never fully rebuilt, certainly not as anything resembling its former self. Now we move firmly into the imperial period and look at the settlement at Magontiacum. This is yet another place named after a lost local tribe where the etymology of the town's original name is really kind of up for debate. As a Roman settlement, Magontiacum was founded by Drusus the Younger in 13 to 12 BCE. 
For context, Drusus the Younger was one of the favorites of Augustus. He was the brother of the later emperor Tiberius and also the father of Germanicus. So by extension, he was the granddad of Caligula and one of the imperial family members via Augustus's wife, Livia. At any rate, Drusus the Younger was an extremely popular and charismatic guy who died young. And, you know, that really would have a big impact on the imperial succession later. But let's stick with Maguntiacum for now. This was a major base for the legions and for what was known as the Classis Germanica, which is the river fleet the Romans used to help control the Rhine and respond rapidly to threats from the Germans across the frontier. The town of Maguntiacum grew up around the base that the Romans built here. So there was a legionary base away from the river and then the naval base. And between them, there were a lot of opportunities for locals to make money. So a lot of camp followers gathered and eventually they created an entire city. Since this area remained a major base for a long time, it developed into a full fledged city. When Drusus died a few years after the city's foundation, the locals remembered him fondly and they built the monument you see on the right in his honor. It's called Drusus's Tower or something of that nature. They also had an aqueduct here and a fourth century gate. The aqueduct's remains are seen in the picture on the left. The gate itself was rather underwhelming, so I didn't feature it. Today, this city is still around and it is called Mines. Um, as for the Tower of Drusus, it's actually located in the heart of an old 17th century citadel, and later occupiers built uh, their garrison around it, I guess, so it could serve as a kind of inspiration. In 43 CE, the Emperor Claudius conquered Britain. This was a huge event for the Romans because this was as far as they'd ever gone and in many ways it'd be the furthest that they would ever go unless you count Trajan's conquest of Dacia. Britain, as early as a century before, had been considered mythical by many in the Greco-Roman world, so Claudius's conquest of Britain was a huge deal. That being said, Britain would never become a central area of the empire and it would never be as fully Romanized as other areas. Yet, there were a couple of major urban settlements that the Romans planted here which would prosper and would really succeed for at least a couple centuries. One of them was Colchester and the other was a place called Londinium. This was built on the north bank of the Thames after the conquest of Britain. Eventually, it became the largest city in Britain having a total population of between 30 and 60,000 people. Shockingly, despite the fact that it was on the far frontier of the Roman world in many ways, the Forum of Londinium was one of the largest urban structures in the Roman Western Europe, at least outside of Italy. So Londinium had a larger forum than Lugdunum or the cities we've looked at in Spain, such as Augusta Emerita. Although to be fair, Augusta Emerita had two fora. So you know, I guess it depends on whether you want two small ones or just one big one. Take your pick, I suppose. Anyhow, um, there aren't all that many interesting remains of Roman London, but one of them is pretty fascinating and still remains somewhat intact. You can still tour it today. This is the London Wall. This was built around 200 CE in order to protect London from the various threats it might face from its neighbors, including some people from the sea out of Scandinavia and northern Germany, and also Pictish raids from across Hadrian's Wall. Um, and actually, the London Wall would stand for a long time, and it would also mark the boundary of Old London until the 18th century, when the city finally became too large to be contained within the walls, and began to spill out. This necessitated the destruction of certain portions of the wall, but there are still enough sections of it left that you can actually still tour it today, and there are tours which actually specialize in just that. Another interesting feature of Londinium's history is that during the famous revolt of Boudicca, about what maybe 10 to 20 years after the initial conquest of Britain, 
Londinium was the primary base from which the Roman governor reorganized his forces and then marched out to finally defeat Boudicca and restore Roman rule. Let's move out of the British Isles and back to the Rhine frontier. Here we find another settlement called Colonia Agrippina. This was originally the capital city of the Uvii, one of the tribes that Caesar conquered, but the Romans then imposed a grid pattern upon the city and would often use this oppidum as a major base from which to launch invasions of Germany. It was used especially heavily after Varus's disaster in 9 CE when he lost three legions. The Romans under Germanicus, one of the stepsons or step-grandsons, I should say, of Augustus, led a number of invasions of Germany as reprisals, and he often based himself out of the city which would become known as Colonia Agrippina. It wasn't called that at first, it was probably just called Ubii or Ubiorum or something along those lines. Its economic activity was very much fueled by two legions being stationed nearby. It eventually got its name because while Germanicus was stationed here, he had his family with him, including the young Caius, who grew up to become Caligula. He earned his nickname in camp as Little Boots because his mom dressed him up as a soldier. This was also the birthplace of Germanicus's daughter, Agrippina the Younger, so Caligula's sister and later the mother of the Emperor Nero and wife of Emperor Claudius. When Agrippina the Younger married her uncle Claudius in 50, he was smitten with the much younger woman, and she convinced him that her birth was a significant enough event in world history that the place of her birth should be renamed in her honor and officially uh, categorized as a Roman colony. So uh, Claudius agreed, and he elevated his wife's birthplace to a full-blown colony bearing her name. Later, the city kept growing, and by 89, under Domitian, who was, among other things, a very good organizer, he also had some issues of paranoia, but he was a good organizer, sort of Nixon-esque. Anyway, um, Colonia Agrippina officially became the provincial capital of Germania Inferior in 89, BC, uh, 89 CE. Excuse me. Um, this province would change names a few times. Sometimes it's also called Lower Germany. Um, it just refers to its position on the river. It doesn't mean this is some inferior section of Germany. It just refers to ge the geographical location vis-a-vis uh, -vis the river Rhine. Um, of course, today, uh, the city has long dropped the Agrippina part of its name. I'm sure Agrippina the Younger would be outraged by this, but it did retain the Colonia part. However, it has transformed into Cologne. So if you see the city of Cologne on the map, that is a corruption of the Roman word colonia and not a reference to man fume. Most casual fans of Roman history are very familiar with the Rhine frontier and also with Rome's frontier with Persia, but they often neglect the Danubian frontier, which was at least as important as the other two, and arguably more so since it protected Rome's richest and most prosperous and populated provinces. So, Let's take a look at one of the key points along the Danubian defenses, the city of Singidunum. As with some of the major cities of Gaul, this began life as a Celtic apida, or apidum, because it's a singular. And this would have been founded in the early 3rd century BCE, corresponding very closely in time with the Celtic invasion of Greece in 279 or 278. That invasion resulted in the sack of Delphi and then the settlement of the Celts elsewhere in the Balkans. This area, today's modern Serbia, was conquered by the Romans and then integrated around 75 BCE. They took over the site of Singidunum and kept using it. As they set up their frontier defenses, especially under Augustus, who was much more systematic about it than the Republic had been, um, Singidunum would become one of the points in the Danubian limes. The limes are effectively frontier defense lines, and Singidunum was a part of it. Mostly it wasn't quite on the front line, but it was still a part of the defense grid. 
After the conquest of Dacia, it will be behind the lines, and that will be a period during which it will prosper quite a bit. Um, it also was a part of the province of Mysia, and it was mostly a headquarters for legions, which meant that it was another of these frontier military towns. It was the headquarters first of the 8th Legion Augusta, and then after that unit was reassigned, another unit was moved in, the 4th Legion Flavia Felix. During the 5th century, the city of Singidunum fell several times, and it was basically destroyed. This was due to the actions of the Romans fighting against the Huns and the Goths and other invaders, and basically what was there was more or less destroyed. So during the 6th century, Justinian I, in the year 535, decided to refound the city fresh, and that is probably when the fortifications you see here were constructed. However, there was another great invasion of the Balkans. This occurred around 630, and Singidunum fell to the Slavs. The Slavs have remained in control of this area, and today Singidunum remains as a site, but today it is known as Belgrade, and it is the capital of Serbia. Now let us go to Dacia, an area added to the empire in the early 100s and then abandoned in the 270s. One of the major Roman settlements there was called Apulum. According to the Greek geographer Strabo, the city was known by the locals as Apulon, and this was a major city of the Dacians. The Dacian kingdom basically emerged during the course of the 1st century CE, and by the beginning of the 2nd century, Trajan began to view it as a threat to Rome from the outside, so he embarked upon a conquest across the Danube and through the mountains of this independent kingdom. It took the better part of the first decade of the 2nd century to conquer Dacia. After Trajan's conquest, Apulum was then turned into a castrum, which is a Roman term, which means anything from a fortified camp, we've already looked at a few examples of those, or a permanent fortress. This term has a pretty broad uh, meaning, but basically Apulum was there to be a military base, which would be used to exercise control. It also served as the headquarters of the 13th Legion Gemina. It emerged as the largest city in Roman Dacia and as the capital of the new province of Dacia Apollensis. While Dacia did see some progress in terms of Romanization, this was by far one of the least successful conquests that Rome made, as during the third century crisis, the emperor Aurelian decided that because Dacia was outside of the Danubian frontier, that he needed to shorten the frontier by retreating from this area. Despite the early Roman withdrawal, and there only having been in Dacia for about 150 to 160 years, Romanian is actually a Romance language which has a lot in common with Latin. One would not expect that given the brevity of Rome's tenure in Dacia, but it is the fact. So there you go. Here, Those are some examples of um, Roman coloniae. Oh, by the way, today Apulum is known as Alba Iulia, which to me actually sounds way more Roman than Apulum. But anyhow, that's all I have for you. Next time, we'll look at the decay of Roman cities as the empire falls, and then we will look at the last sort of great Roman city, Constantinople.